So our birthday rock star is Laura Petrella. So during her PhD at UWA, Laura applied a multidisciplinary and multi-scale approach to study the formation of high-grade gold mineralization at the world-class Kelly the Gold Deposit located in the Tanami Northern Territory. So I'm really excited to hear about her research. And yeah, I'm so grateful that you've come on. So thank you so much, so much, Laura. Thanks, Jess, um, for this kind invitation. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, so um, this presentation is a summary of uh, the work I conducted during my PhD, looking at the Cali deposit uh, located in the Northern Territory of Australia. Uh, but before I start, I want to acknowledge my supervisors at UWA and Newmont who supported uh, this project. Um, so my, my work during my PhD consisted in investigating the different controls on the gold mineralization with a particular focus on uh, the high-grade gold mineralization at Cali. And I should say that Cali is considered as an orogenic gold deposit. And it is also a world-class deposit with an endowment of approximately 14 million ounces of gold. Um, so next slide. Yes. Um, so that is why, what I will be talking about. So first, I will talk about the structural control on mineralization. And then I will do a summary of the petrography of the mineralization and the alteration. I will talk about the lithostratigraphic control on mineralization, the age of mineralization. I will also talk about a sulfur isotope study uh, I conducted at Cali and how that could be used as a tool for exploration. And then I will talk about the controls on the high grade um, gold mineralization. Um, so uh, Cali is uh, part of the Dead Bullock Soak mining camp that is located in uh, the Granite Tanami origin uh, that is part of the North Australian Kraton. It is hosted in Paleoproterozoic sediments of the Tanami group that have been metamorphosed to the upper green schist fascias to antibolite fascias. And they are also intruded by numerous uh, granitic intrusion dated at approximately um, 1800 million years. Uh, this is a geological map of uh, the Dead Bullock Soak uh, camp with uh, the outline of the Cali pits here. And these are other um, pits that are already mined out now. And uh, the mineralization is hosted uh, in the Dead Bullock formation uh, that is um, composed of different type of sealstones uh, intercalated with uh, Doralitic steel. Something I will be repeating a lot in this presentation is that there are two types of mineralization that are mined at Cali. Uh, one type of mineralization is associated with sulfides, and it is found in iron-rich sealstones um, that are highlighted in blue in the stratigraphic column. And the other type of mineralization um, is uh, uh, vein, like uh, visible gold in veins, and it is hosted in finely laminated sealstones that are characterized with uh, graphitic layers and have highlighted in uh, red in the stratigraphic column. And mineralization is found uh, along structural pathways that are in gray in uh, over this geological map. And um, which brings me to the structural control. So I did a mapping of all the open pits at Cali and some underground drive, and I came up with three main um, structural events that are affecting the dead bullock formation. So the first event uh, we interpreted as a north-south shortening event, and it is responsible for the tight folding of the sedimentary package and the formation of this type of folds that are uh, east-west uh, trending. The second type of deformation is the one that is the most important to us, because it is associated to mineralization. So it consists in a series of um, um, vein corridors, uh, one um, like this one here. It is associated with the mineralization and it is characterized by a uh, high vein density. These structural corridors are oriented uh, trending northeast and they are steeply dipping to the southeast. 
The veins within the corridors um, are also oriented uh, along the same direction and they're parallel. This is a photo from the calipid where you see all of these veins. So the, these veins, we call them V2 and they are the one carrying the mineralization. And we interpret this event as being a local northwest southeast shortening event. Yes, yeah, so I was talking about the third deformation event, which locally overprint mineralization, and it is associated with a series of um, north south uh, rivers um, faults, um, and it, which are associated with carbonate veins and uh, sericite alteration. Semitic alteration, and we uh, interpret this as a local east-west uh, shortening event. Uh, here you see um, uh, V2 veins from the Cali deposit um, as well. And so more on the, these vein corridors. So they are associated with a planar fabric, which is associated with small scale fold. So these small scale fold are not uh, easy to see. Um, but this is an image, a photo from the, cat, the Collie Wobble Pit that shows um, the small scale fold here. And um, so the V2 veins, they are steeply dipping, they are parallel to the structural pathways, and they also show a small offset that indicates a reverse movement. Um, so we um, interpret these V2 veins as being shear extensional veins. Um, this is a map of um, underground drive that cuts across um, one of the vein corridors. And we see that the vein density increases in the center of the vein corridors, and so does the gold grade. Uh, within the center of the vein corridors, we also see a different type of V2 veins, which is more shallow, uh, almost flat, as you can see here. And we think all of this uh, indicates um, increased grid uh, flow uh, towards the center of the vein corridor. Um, now about the petrography. So first, the petrography of the vein hosted mineralization. Uh, so this type of mineralization consists in visible gold constrained within coarse veins. And this uh, mineralization is higher grade with an average of six gram per ton of gold. These quartz veins are composed of quartz, plagioclase, uh, case part, uh, chloride, biotite, sericite, and also minor amount of um, sulfides, such as uh, pyrite, pyrotite, and arsenopyrite, and minor amounts of phosphate. Um, the veins are associated with a narrow selvage that is not always visible, um, and the selvage is composed of chloride. You can see that it's very narrow, uh, only a few millimeters uh, thick um, on this backscatter image here. There is another alteration that is wider than like associated with um, this mineralization, but uh, it is not obvious. Uh, you can't see it on the core, for example. Uh, it consists of decarbonation of the whole rock. So when the whole rock is not mineralized, it contains this um, graphitic uh, laminations. So when it is mineralized, the graphitic material is uh, removed. And now the strata bond mineralization. Um, so it is very different. It, is, uh, it consists of um, layers uh, of sulfides that are bedding parallel and composed mainly of pyrotite with minor pyrite and arsenopyrite. Uh, although this mineralization is bedding parallel, it is not um, a syn genetic mineralization. Uh, because the amount of sulfide on the mineralization really increases or is present along the vein corridors, as we can see on this section. Away from the vein corridors, the host truck, which is iron rich stone for this type of mineralization, uh, doesn't contain much sulfide, but contains magnetite. When mineralization is present, the magnetite has been removed. And uh, in this type of mineralization, gold is. Um, occurs as free gold in macrofractures of arsenopyrite, uh, as we can see here. Um, so now I want to talk about the lithostratigraphic control on mineralization, which is very uh, important at Cali. Um, so this is a diagram that shows simplistically the mineralization at Cali. So we have a structural pathways that brings 
fluid to uh, the system. And when this fluid interacts with a carbonaceous host rock, uh, the carbonaceous material will be uh, removed, which is changing the pH and the oxygen fugacity of the fluid and cause the deposition of the gold in veins. So that is what is creating the vein hosted type of mineralization. When the fluid is interacting with um, iron-rich sealstones, the iron-rich minerals such as magnetite are replaced um, by sulfides by a process called sulfidation. And this, is, uh, this process is uh, causing the destabilization of gold um, in the host rock. So we have two different types of mineralization. Um, that are um, of different endowment. Uh, this uh, one creates higher uh, grade mineralization. Um, and this is only due to the difference in geochemistry or nature of the whole rock. Um, so the next step um, is, uh, the next aspect is the edge of mineralization. So because uh, they're so different, we wanted to confirm they were formed at the same age, and we also wanted to have a bit more information on the mineralization age. So we did um, laser ablation ICPMS on Xenotim uh, to do uranium lead geochronology uh, for both types of mineralization. So we analyzed uh, Xenotim um, for the vein of mineralization that were present inside the B2 veins and preferably integral with gold. And we obtain an age of 1805 uh, million years approximately. In the case of the stratamol mineralization, we selected xenotin that were integral with sulfides associated to mineralization. Uh, we analyzed 12 grains and also obtained the same age of 1805 million years approximately. So that confirmed uh, that uh, both type of mineralization occurred a wave formed uh, approximately at the same time. We also dated um, the later hydrothermal event, uh, the carbonate veins associated with the D3 event. So we selected xenotins inside the, the carbonate, uh, carbonate veins, and we obtained an age of approximately 1790 um, million years. Um, which is uh, very close to the mineralization edge, uh, but a bit younger. Uh, that tells us um, uh, that this event happened really quickly after mineralization. And this is a simple summary of um, the history of the Cali deposit. So we had the first event that folded the sedimentary package. Then we had the formation of these uh, fluid pathways, structural pathways um, in red, and um, that brought fluid to the host rocks. And we had different types of mineralization and different types of alteration depending on the host rock. And finally, a um, third event that uh, created the reverse faults and the sericitic alteration and the carbonate veins that prostate the mineralization. Um, so now, um, the sulfur isotope study. So I wanted to understand more about the mineralizing fluid. So I conducted an in-situ um, sulfur isotope measurements of different types of sulfides. Um, so I selected sulfides away from mineralization um, that I interpret as uh, diagenetic or early and not uh, related to mineralization. I then selected sulfide associated to the strata mineralization. I also selected sulfide associated to the vein hosted mineralization. So sulfide from within the V2 veins or within the cell bed, and sulfides associated with the V3 veins, so associated to the third deformation event. And uh, this diagram here shows uh, the results I obtained for Cali. So you see here the Delta 34 sulfur values that shows three distinct populations. Uh, this group here, close to uh, zero, corresponds to the early or diagenetic sulfide. This group, the blue group, corresponds to the later uh, D3 event. And uh, the large group uh, includes the sulfides from the vein hosted mineralization and the strata bond uh, mineralization. And we see that the sulfur isotope signature 
of both type of minimization uh, overlaps, um, which is very interesting and tells us that um, the two type of mineralization might have formed from the same mineralizing fluid and also from a fluid that is distinct from uh, the uh, B3 vein. Uh, that is something that we kind of expected because we already noticed that the two types of mineralization are formed along the same structure and they're also formed at the same age. Um, this is looking a bit more uh, closer uh, in detail at the strata bond mineralization. So the sulfur isotope uh, branches, um, delta 34 sulfur branches of the strata bond mineralization is quite wide and it shows a temporal shift towards lighter values. And we know this because um, of the pyogenetic sequence of the sulfides. We know that pyrotide crystallized earlier and that arsenopyrite crystallized uh, last. So we interpret this shift uh, as an increased, progressive increase in the oxygen fugacity of the fluid that is caused um, by the progressive alteration of the whole stroke. And we note uh, that gold is associated with the latest phase uh, to crystallize, and which is also corresponds to the highest oxygen fugacity. Um, now, can we use um, this uh, data as an exploration tool uh, in the Tanami? So uh, I came, um, I compared my data with all the, the sulfur isotope data I could find in the Tanami, and I came up with this diagram with again the delta 34 sulfur uh, um, uh, here. And it shows a ranges of delta 34 sulfur signature for sulfides associated to mineralization. So what you see here is um, my data for sulfides associated to mineralization at Cali. This is sulfides associated to mineralization at Cali, but from a different study. This is sulfides associated to mineralization from the Tanami goldfield and here from the Granis goldfield. So they have overlapping um, sulfur isotope signature, which is different from the sulfur isotope signature of other sulfides that are not related to mineralization at Cali, but also in the Tanami goldfield and in the Granis. And um, so that means that we could use uh, the sulfur isotope signature as a tool for exploration. If we find the sulfides and we look at its um, delta 34 sulfur, if it falls within uh, this mineralization range, then we might look at sulfides that is associated to mineralization. The other uh, important information um, that we can gain from this is that the, the Tanami gold fields is um, being located here and the granite is um, located here. They are far apart, uh, but still they show the same sulfur isotope uh, signature. So they also are the, the gold mineralization in this um, case, they're hosted in the different type of host rock. So that tells us that we might have a common um, sulfur or mineralized um, mineralization reservoir or source for the gold mineralization in the Tanami, and that a common source might be uh, quite deep. Next, um, I want to talk about the high grade uh, mineralization. So, one thing that is interesting and very amazing at uh, Cali is that we have this type of veins that are quite narrow and they are very concentrated in gold. Uh, the formation of this type of vein is difficult to explain when we consider a traditional geochemistry of gold transport as an aqueous species. Uh, because dissolved aqueous gold species, they have a low and limited solubility in solution, which means that to create these very rich gold veins, you need to, to um, when you need a very large amount of fluid to circulate through the veins. And we don't have evidence at Cali for a very large amount of fluid uh, circulating through veins or through the deposits. So that led us to look for evidence uh, of the contribution of colloidal gold to the formation of mineralization. And I will do a really brief review of what colloidal gold is. 
Um, so when we talk about whole colloids, we talk about a solid particle that is of nanometric size and that is entirely composed of gold atoms. Um, the colloids have to be in a stable suspension in aqueous solution, and they also have uh, different properties. They, have ne they are negatively charged, and they have a large surface area compared to their volume, which uh, gives them their unique property. Uh, they form or nucleate from a solution that is supersaturated in gold. And the reason why we are so interested in gold colloid is that they allow for the concentration of 5,000 times more gold uh, in solution than gold present as an aqueous species. And that is something that is very important and that might uh, really help understand the formation of the very high grade uh, gold veins. And one drawback from the gold colloid is that they tend to uh, aggregate uh, spontaneously, especially at high temperature. So that prevents the transport in aqueous solution. Uh, however, um, Old and recent experimental <laughs> studies have shown um, that uh, transport of colloidal gold might be possible if they are protected uh, by colloidal silica. Um, so, but anyway, to come back to Kali, um, that is the method that we use in our search for gold colloid. So, we took a very high grade gold vein, we made a thin section, we looked at it under the SEM, and we targeted a micro inclusion in the gold grain. So this is a backscatter image showing a gold grain, this is quartz. And um, uh, we targeted this type of inclusion. Um, in order to see colloids, you need to use transmission electron microscopy, which allows you to image a very small um, nanometric material. So we had to extract, to use uh, transmission electron microscopy, we had to extract this area of interest uh, using this process. And we ended up with this very small sample that we call a foil. And uh, this sample is coming from here where you see the gold grain and uh, the inclusions inside the gold. And we did find gold colloids in these inclusions uh, exactly um, here. And uh, these are all transmission electron microscopy images of gold colloids. You see that the gold colloid sizes varies between half a nanometer to 11 nanometers. They are concentrated along the contact with the gold grain, but they also are isolated. And they are um, preserved uh, within amorphous silica. So the phase that you see here is amorphous silica, and the rest of the inclusion is composed of amorphous carbon. Um, so what we think or what we proposed um, for um, the the preservation of the gold colloids is that colloidal silica was deposited in the vein as a silica gel containing uh, gold colloids. The colloids um, aggregated to form gold grains, and during the crystallization of the gold grain, some of this amorphous silica got trapped um, uh, as inclusion within the gold grain, and that what allowed for the preservation of uh, the gold nanoparticle that we saw um, at Cali in our sample. Now, we don't know where the colloids have formed. They might have formed uh, at the site of mineralization through very um, efficient fluidwork interaction processes, or they might have formed at depths and have been transported through the crust uh, thanks to colloidal silica, and then deposited at the site of mineralization. That is something that will require a bit more work. Um, but to conclude, um, I think the most important take of the message from this work is uh, that to uh, form mineralization at Cali, you need to consider two principles, two aspects. Uh, a structural control, um, you need the right type of a structure that provides a pathway to the mineralizing fluid. In the case of Cali, it's the D2 vein corridors. Uh, the second aspect is the lethal stratigraphic control on mineralization. So that is also very important because you need a reactive host truck to deposit the gold. Some of the host truck, like at Cali, the dolerated seals, they're not reactive. So even though they have the B2 veins, they will not carry mineral, they will not have mineralization. So you need the reactive host truck. 
And within the reactive host trucks, they're not equal. Some host trucks are more reactive uh, than others. We've seen that the carbonaceous host trucks are way more efficient at depositing um, gold um, than the, the iron-rich host trucks that produce the strata mineralization. So you end up with a dif significant difference in endowment. So um, both the, stru the structural and the lithographic, lithostratigraphic controls are essential and equal, uh, equally important to form um, the Kali mineralization. Um, the next point is uh, that the sulfide associated to mineralization at Kali and in the rest of the Tanami that we know of have overlapping uh, sulfur isotope uh, signature. Uh, so that is something that we can use uh, to, um, as a tool for exploration. And finally, we've shown uh, for the first time uh, that uh, colloidal uh, gold uh, could be responsible or it could explain the formation of the very high grade gold veins. Um, and that's something that requires um, following up on. Um, but um, it is a very important new observation that was made at Kent. And uh, that's, that's it uh, for my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Thank you so much, Laura.